I've always wanted to stand in this red circle. I'm going to savor it. All right. So my basic premise is that serendipity is a good thing and that losing serendipity is a bad thing. And I'm not talking about the cheesy movie. (laughs) I'm talking about this kind of serendipity. The effect by which one accidentally stumbles upon something fortunate, especially while looking for something entirely unrelated. For example, a friend of mine came to Montreal a few months ago, met some really interesting people, as a result ended up moving to Montreal, leaving a job that he was at for 10 years, starting a company, and now is standing on stage at TEDx Concordia. (laughs) Let's start off with some good news. Overall, opportunities for serendipity are definitely increasing, thanks to things like Foursquare and Twitter and Facebook. The bad news and the problem is that life-changing serendipity, the type of serendipity that changes the course of your life, is in real danger of being lost. And that's pretty shocking (laughs) and a little bit scary. You would think now that we're so connected and that we're so global, the fact that we can fly anywhere in the world we want and read news about any place we care about, there'd be many more opportunities for major serendipitous events. The reality is that we're still living in our own close-knit clusters. This is a map of where people actually fly around the world. And you'll notice it's clustered on places like the US and Europe and China and continues to exclude most of the rest of the world. Same thing with news. This is also a map of the world, distorted based on where people in the U.S. read their news about. And so the top left right there, that's the U.S. And this tells us that people in the U.S. read news about places in the U.S. and countries that the U.S. has invaded. (laughs) What this shows us is that we're still living in our own bubbles, making friends with people that are extremely similar to us, (laughs) reinforcing those similarities, making us more and more similar. (laughs) All the while thinking that we all think different. I think human beings have a very limited interest in going outside their comfort zones and trying new things. We have really good filters that keep other information out. The Sufis have a great quote, knowledge that takes you not beyond yourself is far worse than ignorance. And unfortunately, a lot of the technology that we're coming to rely on to expose us to new things is making it really easy to stay within our own bubbles because it caters to what we tell it we want and what we like. There's a great book called Stumbling on Happiness, and its basic premise is that we're really bad at predicting what will actually make us happy. We think we know what we want, but we really don't. We think we want the big house and the big car and the big paycheck. Turns out those things don't make us any happier in the long run. And so, without big serendipitous events, the types of events that break us outside of our bubbles and expose us to new ideas and new experiences, we may never discover the things that truly make us happy. Let me give you a few examples. We tell Amazon and Netflix what kind of movies we like, which means we're going to get more of the same kinds of movies. Same thing with books. We teach iTunes and Pandora what kind of music we like, which means we're going to get more of the same kind of music. We tell Google News what news we want to read, which means we're going to read the type of news we want to read. We won't see anything else. We use services like Yelp to figure out where we should go eat, so we're going to go where everybody else has already gone, killing that sense of self-discovery and serendipity. We gather in places where like-minded people talk about like-minded stuff, (laughs) reinforcing that like-mindedness. We use sites like Match.com and OkCupid to find our perfect mate based on very specific traits that we think we want and we think are really important to us. They ask us questions like this, how often do you tweet to help you find your match? (laughs) I bet that most of the people that are married here would never have met if they were using a site like this. I bet there was a lot of serendipity involved. Even something as simple as Google Directions reduces our opportunities for serendipity by getting us straight from point A to B I think the parts of a trip that you enjoy most, that you remember most, are the parts where you make a wrong turn, where you don't know where you're going. So here's the way I see it. This circle represents the things that you already like and you're already aware of. And this represents the things that things like Amazon and Netflix and Yelp are going to expose you to. 
The problem is there's so much other stuff that you're not going to see if you rely on these services. The circle is so big, I couldn't even fit it on the screen. And even though access to these things has gotten easier, we rarely take advantage of it. And that means we're going to miss out on maybe a new favorite song, or the best dessert you've never had, or a new life calling, or that soulmate that you're not going to find on Match.com. Are we screwed? <laughs> not necessarily. There's things like Foursquare and even Groupon that are exposing us to new opportunities for serendipity. Something I wrote a year ago is a service called Assisted Serendipity that helps you along in the relationship department by notifying you when the male to female ratio is in your favor. <laughs> I think TED does an amazing job at fostering serendipity. It shows you what happens when you bring different types of people together and help them exchange ideas, when you bring different clusters together. Even their website does an amazing job, showing you videos that have nothing to do with videos you've previously watched or videos that you've liked. Frighteningly, if you know about Chat Roulette, it has a very similar type of mechanic. <laughs> so I'm not sure what to think. All right. The New York Times uh, released a version of their online newspaper which defaults to what they call serendipity view which shows you different kinds of stories that have nothing to do with each other, but that help you discover things you would normally see if you're just reading the sections that you are normally attracted to. I think we could do with a lot less like buttons and retweet buttons, which are really good at making sure that we all see the same exact story. Instead, I'd love to see a serendipity button that instead of making sure that your cluster sees the same thing, it shows you what other clusters of people found really interesting. For example, Say we shared what the Red Hat Society found really interesting with university students. The Red Hat Society may discover the joys of Twitter. <laughs> and university students may discover that <laughs> you can have just as much fun when you're older. I think we should stop relying on things like on Google to uh, discover new things, because Google is really good at giving us exactly what we think we want. How about we create a serendipity engine where you enter what you think you want and it gives you something completely unrelated? <laughs> <laughs> if that's too much work, how about we just follow a random person on Twitter? I bet Lisa Tickled Pink had some, has some interesting perspectives on, on life. Or, who knows, maybe what? Oh, sorry, skipped ahead. Maybe pick up a random magazine at the newspaper or the dentist office or the airport, you know? See something that other people are interested in. <laughs> or maybe watch that movie that you wouldn't normally watch. <laughs> or maybe not. Thank you very much.